So good afternoon, everybody. It's 1.30. I think we need to start uh, the, the session. Uh, so I'm very happy to have you all here um, in person uh, for this extremely interesting session uh, about the portfolio of treatment for uh, tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, this session is sponsored by, uh, by Edwards. And I am extremely happy to have uh, with me uh, a group of experts, actually the expert on, on that therapy uh, with Volker Rudolph um, on, the, on the left, Edith Lubos, I should have started with Edith actually from, from Hamburg, uh, Jörg Hausleiter from Munich, Philipp Lourdes, and of course I'm extremely happy to co-moderate, I would say, this session with uh, DJ Cheche from Toulouse. Thank you very much, Didier. So let's start um, with uh, the objective of the session. And you know, I think it's quite clear, uh, we would like to introduce uh, the different option. And there are several, you will see, um, that we can use to treat tricuspid regurgitation. And um, for doing this, we will look at anatomical consideration for selecting the different devices. We will review these different options with different speakers. And you will see it in a, also in an interactive way. So please ask your question. We will get your, uh, Didier will get your question uh, directly and we will give you priority, priority to your question at any time. And at the end, we will also have a recorded live demonstration uh, with Jörg Ausleiter from Munich uh, of a Pascal system. That's the objective and uh, the plan I already mentioned. And uh, I, would, uh, I would like to, to start maybe with a presentation of the patient and uh, invite Jörg to, to start the session. Yes, Fabian, th thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to discuss with you the different options which we do have for the tricuspid regurgitation. And as you heard, we're gonna discuss also a life in the box case and I'm going to present or start this video which is the patient presentation um, of the patient which we treated. Yeah, very glad to uh, present you our case today. We have an 88 year old female patient and she suffers from dyspnea on exertion. Currently she's New York heart class 3 and she um, you know, had multiple um, hospitalizations due to heart failure when she was transferred to our center and we identified in our exam that she has a right-sided heart failure and her symptoms are due to severe tricuspid regurgitation. And regarding her comorbidities, she has atrial fibrillation and we observed a preserved renal function with a GFR just under 60 and she had um, a few weeks ago, she had a stroke in February this year and she has still persistent paresis of the left arm. We calculated a tri-score um, of four points, predicting atrus and um, uh, in-hospital mortality for isolated tricuspid surgery. We uh, performed the right heart cath last week and we could exclude um, pulmonary hypertension. We observed um, PA mean pressure of 21 and only mild elevated um, wedge pressure of 60 millimeters of mercury and cardiac output was uh, within normal range. On the right side, you see um, the patient's medication. She takes a beta blocker. Um, unfortunately, she doesn't tolerate um, ACE inhibitors or ARP because of the low blood pressure situation. So, so we had to focus on diuretic therapy. She has a loop diuretic, stromolactone, and tridines. She also takes a pizzaban for her atrial fibrillation. In the coronary angiogram, um, we could exclude significant coronary other disease, we observed only mild narrowing of the medial LAD, and right coronary was um, in, uh, okay, so nothing to intervene. When we did the echocardiogram um, TTE, on the left side you can appreciate the uh, um, left ventricle function, systolic function is, uh, is normal, and mitral valve was also um, <laughs> uh, within normal, only mild regurgitation of the mitral valve. When we were focusing on the right ventricle, you see this massive dilatation of the right ventricle and um, um, systolic function of the RV was um, still preserved, um, but we then um, also appreciated this severe tricuspid reputation, um, which we created um, four out of five grades, and we see um, the TE exam just in a few minutes during the procedure. 
So this is the patient presentation. That's, Jörg, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. I, I learned something. You can go up and show a film, so you don't need to say anything. But that's the beauty, yeah. So then now we, we will ask you a question. And I forgot something very important. Mm -hmm. um, Mauricio Taramaso is uh, answering your question as well. So he's our chat master. Uh, so don't hesitate really to, to ask questions. And in the room, you can stand up. There are microphones everywhere. And we will be uh, able and keen to answer your question at, uh, at any time. So uh, you, you presented the patient, 88-year-old uh, female, uh, very severe, tricuspid regurgitation, um, atrial fibrillation. The right ventricular function is, uh, is, is quite good. So my question, what is in your eye the, the, the etiology of tricuspid regurgitation in this patient? Or what was your interpretation of uh, all these findings? Um, <clears throat> I think, oops, excuse me. Um, you probably can still appreciate here on this image that the right ventricle is dilatated, but we have a huge dilatation of the right atrium. We have atrial fibrillation, and probably what you have seen is that also the tricuspid leaflets are not too severely um, tethered. So this is a situation where we probably have more like an atrial um, functional TR, probably um, due to the long-standing atrial fibrillation. Okay. And maybe we can ask uh, Didier, and, but I will ask you first. You, you have seen the anatomy of the patient. What, what, would, what would be your, your guess or your, your strategy in that patient as, an, as a treatment option? So what I like with this patient is the fact that first it's a high risk patient, and so that patient deserves something, a treatment. Uh, the, the RV function is not uh, severely impaired, so uh, the potential benefit in terms of intervention seems obvious for this uh, lady. So I would consider uh, for this particular patient, as it is standard of care now, to start with the uh, uh, evaluation of the feasibility of, of an edge to edge repair uh, first. And uh, if the patient was not suitable for this type of therapy, it would have been uh, considered for a, a uh, TTVR, a valve replacement. So, but first, uh, I, would say, I would say that this patient seems feel suitable for a, an edge to edge repair. Volker, what, what is your opinion? So, we have also options available, a cardio band, would that be an option? You have a lot of experience. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely say yes, but I agree that, first of all, we would um, evaluate for edge to edge, uh, particularly given the age and, and the simplicity, uh, potential simplicity of the procedure. And um, and therefore, um, I, I would agree, but, I mean, CardiBand could be an option given that, as Jörg said, there's no tethering, and this is a, a really a good predictor to have a good outcome for CardiBand as well. Edith? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, the kidney function is okay, so I definitely would also think about like a cardiovent option. But of course, 88 years, really sick patient, you, you would reduce the time of the procedure and I would also definitely go for edge to edge. Also that the medication is, uh, so it's all, all around and uh, yeah, surgery is out, so definitely. And if replacement would be available, you would... What would you, what would you, your guess, Philippe? Could that be an option? Um, yes, I mean we would have to to look a little bit closer on annular um, dimensions, um, do a CT, do a bit more planning. Obviously, it, um, it requires more planning than going forward with edge to edge. But um, looking at it, it seems to be within within a range where um, replacement um, could be an option. Yes, but having said that, I mean this is this is I totally agree. This is atrial functional TR, and this is such a good substrate for edge to edge. I mean, these patients, they almost always benefit. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward. May I ask you, uh, Jorg, about, you have a huge experience, first in terms of evaluating these uh, very complex patients, and you uh, just uh, uh, elaborated a bit on the utility of the TRISCOR. Could you uh, provide us with more insight? How do you utilize it? Is it a useful tool to select the appropriate patients in your experience? To be honest? No, yeah. honestly. <laughs> On, absolutely no. Always. Um, <laughs> no, <clears throat> because the, the patients which we are in more than 98% evaluating are patients who are in these late 70s, 80s, or even late 80s, who are really no candidates for a surgical option. Um, we do know that patients who are being considered eligible for a surgical procedure 
still have a mortality rate somewhere around 8 to 10 percent. Um, so these patients where they even have kidney function, liver dysfunction, um, there are no candidates for any surgical procedures. So um, I don't think that we um, really need to evaluate such scores. They are not helpful for us right now. We would love to have some some scoring systems incorporating all the results which we are just gathering to understand better what are the uh, outcomes of an, an interventional procedure in such patients con uh, concerning not the early safety uh, or because we know that all our procedures are very safe but considering what pay what kind of patient is really having a good profit let's say after one year that would be much more interesting. So Jörg, the majority is for, uh, seems to be for edge-to-edge -edge repair in that patient. Can you, can you share with us maybe your, your experience with edge-to-edge -edge repair? So I'm going to stay here and, and continue with yes. the next or presentation. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, I was asked also to summarize a little bit what kind of options do we have on the edge-to-edge -edge repair and what kind of results. Um, <clears throat> So, um, so you know that that we do have this Pascal system, which we are using on the mitral side for quite some time now, and we can also have it CE marked for the use on the tricuspid side. Here is, is the catheter system being shown. You have a, a guiding catheter, a steerable catheter, and an implant catheter, and we do have two implant sizes the regular Pascal device with a, with a width of around 10 millimeters and the Pascal A system with a width of six millimeters. And they are 90 null based, so they're a little bit flexible um, and have a very nice distribution of the pulling forces uh, onto the leaflets. And we can use those uh, both devices very safely and, and elegantly in the tricuspid field. And um, we started um, about a year ago to collect um, data from all other, or for some other European sites, um, to get their learning experience with the Pascal system in the tricuspid field. So we started this registry, which we call PACE registry, the Pascal for tricuspid regurgitation, a European registry. And this is uh, um, a large investigator initiated registry looking at the safety, but also on the efficacy of the Pascal system in the really real world practice. Here are the sites being shown, many sites in, in Germany, but also some in Switzerland, Stockholm and, and Great Britain. It's so far, it's still a retrospective study, but we all want, also want to go now a little bit more prospective because at the end of what you're going to see down here, we are targeting a, a, a size of approximately 1,000 patients so that we can really dive also into a little bit of subgroup analysis. The difference uh, compared to other registries, in investigated, initiated registries, is that we have an echocardiographic core lab, or at least a centralized echocardiographic analysis in the same form so that we can a little bit say something also about the results. <clears throat> so I'm presenting today for the first time the, days, uh, the results of the first 500 patients which we included. And you see here the demographics of those patients, almost 80 years old, around 50% are female, um, high risk scores with a risk score of almost 7%. And you see a lot of comorbidities, 92% atrial fibrillation, about one third had a lead, renal failure with the GFR below 60, also very present um, at 80%. The, uh, the analysis of the echocardiographic analysis uh, data are, is currently available for 370 of those patients. And you see that we're treating around um, 40% really with massive or torrential tricuspid regurgitation, um, mainly a functional secondary etiology with an estimated uh, systolic pulmonary artery pressure around 40. Technical success is very high in these procedures. Although we have these large gaps um, sometimes in these patients, 99% with an average device uh, use of one8 
what you see in the meantime, we are having two thirds of patients being treated with the ACE system, procedural time around two hours, and then a very low SLDA rate uh, confirmed by the echo um, analysis of 2.7%. So right now, when we look at the latest uh, uh, patients, more or less 93% are being treated with the ACE system, the smaller uh, implant as you have seen before. Now what can we achieve? Um, you see here the TR grade in the five grading scale with torrential, massive, and severe TR. Um, and you see that there is a high uh, ratio of those very severe um, um, TR grades. This can be reduced very effectively. More than 80% at discharge had a TR of two plus or less. And this great result is being maintained at follow-up. Right now we're looking at echocardiographic follow-up, a median of around six months. 81% having these good TR reductions. Looking at the data from, uh, from the uh, mortality and need for repeat hospitalizations, these are sick patients, so the rate is rel relatively high. We're still, as you see in the numbers down there, we're still in the process of really getting the follow-up of the majority of patients. This is an ongoing process, but still we're gathering these one-year outcomes in this large patient group. What about the symptoms? Because this is the most important aspect for the patients which we're treating we see that about two-thirds, and this is consistent with all the other um, registries and trials, at follow-up, two-thirds of all these patients are being in New York Heart Class 2 or 1, although the majority, vast majority, 90%, were in Class 3 or 4 before the procedure. Improvement in six-minute walk test, decrease in body weight, which is, is being reported about five kilograms, which I think is pretty substantial and impressive. And we also see a, a little bit of drop, significant drop in the pro BMP. So just concluding this a little bit, as you see the, with the edge-to-edge -edge repair technology as one of the three options which we can use, that this paced registry demonstrates as an investigator initiated registry today the results what we can achieve, that the Pascal ACE system has a very high technical success rate and also procedural safety, although I haven't shown in detail all the 30-day all the outcome data, I have to admit. Efficient TR reduction, uh, I think we were able to show in this echocardiographic analysis, is sustained at six-month follow-up. And this improvement in TR is associated with a significant clinical and, and echocardiographic improvement. Of course, these are just registries, and we need to have prospective randomized clinical trials, and these are underway to compare leaflet repair with medical therapy to really show the advantage of this kind of therapy. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Jorg. So what I propose is to, uh, we continue with Edith's uh, presentation, mm -hmm. who's going to uh, provide us some insights into the late breaking trials about Pascal for tricuspid regurgitation, and then we will have a common discussion with you guys. So, dear colleagues, it's an honor for me to present um, the Pascal repair system to treat tricuspid regurgitation and the clinical evidence. These are my conflict of interests. Actually, Jörg gave me a great introduction because he was presenting the real world data and we have approximately 500 patients that were perfectly analyzed. And um, now we want to go and because he was asking for prospective studies and now I have the honor to present again because in the late breaking news uh, in this morning, actually Rebecca Hahn and Stefan Baus were presenting similar data. Um, I just want to point out what are this, the, the differences, what are the same concept behind the class TR study and the tri-class study. So first of all, both studies are prospective multicenter single arm studies. The class TR study is mainly in the United States and uh, the tri-class study is uh, German centers. So we have approximately similar uh, patients, so 65 in the class TR study and 74 patients randomized uh, tr in the triclass study. So all patients had to have severe tricuspid regurgitation and after um, heart team assessment, 
they receive the Pascal system. So the primary endpoints are also similar regarding um, the freedom of device and procedure related or adverse events at 30 days. But additionally, in the TriClav study, we also were looking at the change in TR severity by echo at discharge. So these are both the baseline characteristics and it's very interesting to see how different um, also the baseline characters can be in a in similar study where the inclusion criteria and the exclusion criteria are almost the same. So if you look at the class TR study, the people or the patients were 77 in mean, whereas in, in the German study, the tri-class study, there were 80. So they were older. Um, we have um, a higher SCS score in, in the tri -class study. We have less tricuspid uh, regurgitation, uh, which is severe, but atrial fibrillation is higher and also renal failure is higher, diabetes is higher, and also the systemic hypertension. So um, looking now in, in, in deeper in the device and procedural success, so what do we see in the class TR study? We have a successful rate of 91%, great. We have a clinical success of almost 80%, and uh, people, 95% were discharged at home, and what you can see, the length of the hospital stay is 2.6 days, which is incredibly low. Um, the device time was around 150, and 1.8 something devices were in mean implanted. So if we look now at the tree class study, more successful rate, but similar clinical success. What is interesting and also different between both studies, the class TR study has included Pascal and ACE, whereas in the tri class study, just ACE was the device that this was used. And so what you were looking, the, the mean number is also similar, but the device time dropped from 150 uh, uh, minutes to 80 minutes. And if you look about the time frame, I mean, the class TR study, we just got the data for one year and now for the tri 30 days. So it's just a short time and we were able to reduce definitely the de device time, but half of the time. And what is interesting in Europe, and I think this has also something to do with governmental and all the stuff, is that the length of the hospital stay is uh, 5.1 days. Um, so talking about TR severity reduction, um, which is interesting in the class TR study, is actually that at 30 days, we, we received like 75 patients uh, per percent for mild and uh, trace TR, whereas um, after one year, and I think this is because of the good data that we also have available regarding the right ventricle remodeling, that actually 86 um, percent of the patient reached moderate or lower TR. What is also important that 100% improved at by at least one TR grade and 75 by at least two grade. And this is definitely something that is similar also to the PACE registry is that of course the patients have a huge profit regarding uh, clinical functional and quality of life. And this is definitely significant. So if we are looking at the TriClass study, um, actually, after 30 days, we reach 90% um, uh, TR severity with mild and trace, and um, which is a better result. Um, but uh, just 88% achieved uh, more than one uh, TR grade reduction. And but overall, 90% of the patient had less than a moderate TR at 30 days. So. Regarding the major adverse events, um, what we are looking at the class TR is the numbers, just to kind of compare with the other study is, look at the bleeding, severe bleeding we have at 30 days, which is kind of comparable, 77%. And this is the reason because of major access site and vascular complications. So the composite major adverse event is 9.2%, and after one year, 16.9%. So all cause mortality, was after one year 10.8%. And we also have a single leaflet detachment, which is approximately 4.6%. Uh, so what are the difference with the tri class is actually there is no, or just one patient had severe bleeding, so 1.5%. There's no major excess side of vascular complication. The all-cause mortality is similar. Um, but the heart failure or hospitalization is lower, and there was no single leaflet detachment um, in this cohort. 
Um, so just overall, to say the survival rate um, when it comes to the class PR study, because we just have the data for one year, we just don't have it yet for the tri-class study, is that we have a survival rate um, of 88% and a rehospitalization rate of 80%. And what is very impressive, actually, with that data is if you look at the, the right figure is to see what's about the heart failure rehospitalization rate. And if you see at one year pre-enrollment and after one year post-procedure, there's a 56.4% reduction. And I think this is very impressive. So um, I would like to conclude. Um, for the class TR study, one year results demonstrated that we definitely have a significant TR reduction. And this was sustained over a year even it was also increasing, actually, and 86% of the patient achieved moderate or less TR, 100% had um, a, a one grade reduction and 75% uh, two grade reduction. So overall, of course, significant reduction in the heart failure hospitalization, an improvement in quality of life in um, a six <laughs> minute walk distance. And I think regarding this study, we definitely learned a lot about patient selection, device procedure, as you really nicely can see also the, the time length of the procedure and how many devices should we use, which device should we use, how is the anatomy, et cetera. For the tri-class study, um, we have 97% uh, freedom from major uh, adverse events, which is great, and also the TR reduction is kind of similar, and also the improvement for quality of life and six-minute walk distance. So thank you very much. So thank you very much, Edith. Uh, I think there are some points to discuss, and I will encourage you also to ask questions in the room um, if you if you want to to speak uh, speak up or stand up and speak uh, and use the mic. So, um, Edith, you nicely presented a quite low rate of single leaflet device attachment uh, in both study actually. Um, why why do you think uh, Pascal has this low rate of single leaflet device attachment? despite the low experience at the beginning and, uh, and the complexity of the patient? So even for the tri-class study, there was no single leaflet detached, um, which is great. And I think, um, what, how do we do actually um, the, the, the treatment of the patient? So most of the time it's in uh, individual leaflet grasping. So, um, so you really can nicely see with the ACE, you have much better echo quality. Um, you really nicely can see how the leaflets are going into the, the Pascal ACE, and then you individually grasp, most of the time the septeral, um, the, the lateral uh, leaflet, and then you jump kind of uh, to the septal uh, leaflet. And I think because the echo is getting better, we are using the ACE, which helps us regarding pictures. Um, we, we know exactly that we are kind of safe because the system also has the ability to elongate, so we are not really scared that we are destroying anything on, on the tricuspid. Um, so um, I think this makes us more confident in also trying being safe, and I think that's the reason why we forget, figured out how to, to use the system. So thank you. There, um, there already have comments coming from the... Uh, our friends connected mainly online and a couple of questions from uh, people on site. So I continue to, uh, to pop up all your comments or concerns, questions. We're going to try to answer them. So uh, maybe I could ask you, uh, Jörg, there, is a couple of there are a couple of questions. Uh, one is coming from Alexander Sedagat, who is connected online, and who tries to... Um, who is wondering how can we correl correlate the immediate uh, procedural results to the clinical outcomes? How, what is acceptable, if I have to rephrase, in terms of final regurgitation? How do you assess the result to say, okay, this patient is going to behave uh, appropriately in the future? I mean... Um, yeah. You want to go first? <laughs> <No>. You're <laughs> welcome. <laughs> um, this is a very important question. I think that we have to rephrase perhaps the question a little bit. Are we more concerned or what we want to see a symptomatic improvement or improvement in terms of hard clinical endpoints? What we do know from our experience from all the other trials which we have performed so far is that already some TR reduction is translating into a symptomatic improvement. And the patients are pleased. They're coming back and they tell you 
how well they are feeling, what kind of good job you did. Um, on the other hand, uh, if we're looking perhaps at harder endpoints, although we're awaiting, of course, the, the, the prospective randomized trials, I assume is the more we can is reduce the TR, the better will be the, the long-term outcome, the better will be the remodeling and um, all the other aspects. So we should try, if possible, to get to the lowest TR if, um, with an, of course, acceptable inflow gradient. Thank you for the, this, this very clear answer. So please. Uh, thank you, Barrieri Fabian Berlin. Um, considering the patient you have um, proposed before, TR four to five, would you um, grade a TR reduction to, for example, two? Would this be an um, valuable result for you? Well, this is what we currently are accepting is moderate or less. Two plus or less is, is what we're gonna try to achieve. If we can achieve one plus, even mm -hmm. better. But what, how would you grade the um, probabilities to achieve less than two? Because like the jump from four to five down to one or trace is like a big one. And I would fear that if we do tier, that you don't have any bailout options left, except for example, cobble valves, but to do like, for example, cardiband before. Well, in, in this consideration, a lot of clinical anatomic echocardiographic factors go into the same discussion. So at the end, there's not a single one, and you can say, let's take this one, and then you're sure that you're gonna achieve uh, one plus TR. So the, the number of leaflets, where the chat is, how big is the gap size, how much tethering do we have, how good is the image quality in echocardiography? There are many, many questions um, um, which are really driving this result. So at the end, it's, it's this entire consideration. Thank you. Okay. So maybe one quick question, uh, maybe for you, Edith. Yeah, there was a, a comment coming from uh, the audience asking about the, the reasons for the differences in terms of uh, outcomes between a triclasp and a clasp TR. How would you summarize the main, the main reasons? Um, yeah, the, the, the outcomes are not so different. So um, <laughs> it's just, you know, I think the major adverse events are definitely different because I think we, we spend more time now in also the excess complication all the system. Um, I think we're at the beginning, it's like on the mitral side and the transport side, is that we are just, you know, you, we wanted to put the Pascal inside and be safe. Now we, we're spending more time all around in the operating room, and I think this is what we see with the, the triclasp. And I think um, also in the class TR study, what you can nicely see is that the number of severe TR in, included in this study was more than 90%, whereas in the triclasp it was a bit lower. So yeah. we also are going now in a way where we're not just looking at torrential and massive, but we're also seeing the patient how is the clinical benefit. So we are also accepting severe or less moderate, and we know it's a safe procedure. It's kind of, I'm not saying easy to do, but we are safe, so uh, why not uh, performing the procedure if So more experience and a bit different uh, selection of the patient, I think. Didier, one more question? Last yeah, one, last, last one, maybe uh, to Philippe. Uh, is there any room left for the regular Pascal for tricuspid regurgitation? <laughs> B10. Uh, short answer, uh, in very, very rare occasions, and I would could not think about one right now in tricuspid. <laughs> So no. No. Okay. No is too strict. I would never say no. Uh, excuse me. Can I have a short question about uh, in your patient selection, is there any level of RV dysfunction uh, is the limit that you refuse the patient for doing CLIP for TR? Volker, do you want to answer this one? I mean, of course, we cannot be sure at the moment, but I think all the data and our experience point towards that uh, we should be careful to exclude patients based so solely on their RV function because the potential to remodel is, is larger than for the LV, certainly. So I think we need to, Didier, we need to move on. And I think there was also some suggestion that uh, the patient you presented uh, could be a candidate for, for replacement. So I would ask uh, Stefan Windecker, he's the head of cardiology in Bern, he's my boss, and also, <laughs> and also uh, one of the European PI of the Trish and One study uh, to present um, about uh, the replacement uh, strategy 
um, and, uh, and, the, and the early result. So not a CMARC device so far. Thank you, Stefan. So thank you for the opportunity to contribute. I, I think we all agree these tables here in the front, they need repair. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I see two tables that re need repair. Uh, uh, I would think at least two clasps. Uh, and I hope the third table uh, will not need to be replaced. So my task uh, will be to talk about uh, a replacement strategy at this point in time. Here you see my uh, disclosures. And um, the the device that I will discuss is uh, the Evoke uh, tricuspid uh, valve replacement system, which is a technology that can be introduced transvenously uh, through the transfemoral vein and uh, with a self-expanding nitinol frame a valve positioned within the tricuspid annulus and delivered through a 28 French transfemoral delivery system. Now, the experience so far, uh, I will present two series. One is the first in human experience of uh, 27 uh, patients that have been treated in the framework of a compassionate use at uh, seven centers in the US and uh, Europe between uh, 2019 and 2020. These patients were deemed inoperable or unsuitable for one transcatheter edge to edge uh, repair. And I think uh, you recognize the patient uh, phenotype that is elderly uh, uh, patients, uh, predominantly uh, female, that are highly symptomatic, have a high surgical risk with an STS of uh, more uh, than eight, with a predominant uh, functional uh, TR uh, etiology and a very high proportion of patients with uh, atrial fibrillation. Now here you see the results uh, at 30 days on the left side and at one year follow up at uh, the right side indicating a rather favorable uh, clinical uh, outcome with uh, no procedural uh, mortality and a an, uh, low mortality of 7% at one year. What you also see is uh, that the procedural uh, success was uh, 25 out of 27 patients. The device could not be implanted in one patient and required an additional treatment and a second patient. And you see the procedural time of uh, 68 minutes, which is rather uh, uh, low. Now, uh, if we look at the TR severity, what is remarkable, and keeping in mind that one patient was not treated with a valve, then you see uh, that uh, the TR is none or mild in nearly 90% of uh, patients. And what you also appreciate is some evidence of a right ventricular remodeling over time, uh, over one year follow up, and a reduction in uh, IVC diameter. If we look then at the functional uh, improvement of uh, these patients, uh, then we recognize that actually 70%, more than two-thirds of patients have only minimal heart failure symptoms, which is remarkable in the context of these patients being highly symptomatic uh, before. And what we also appreciate is the improvement as it relates to six-minute walk test, uh, peripheral edema, even ascites, and uh, more to expected and dose uh, reduction in diuretics. Now, the larger study uh, I'm going to present now is uh, the TRISENT uh, study, which really investigates now in a more systematic perspective uh, fashion and looks at the primary outcome of freedom from device or procedure-related adverse events early on at 30 days, but patients are also follow up uh, long term. This is a study which has been predominantly performed in uh, the US uh, with additional sites in uh, Europe. And what I'm going to present are here 132 patients included at the baseline and with uh, six month follow up available in 56 uh, patients. Again, you see the phenotype of these patients uh, nearly 80 years of uh, age, predominantly female, again, high uh, surgical risk as estimated by the SDS uh, score. There have been previous uh, pacemaker or ICD implantation in one third uh, of uh, patients, and the vast majority has functional uh, TR in ideology. Here you see uh, the proced procedural outcome, and uh, the procedure in the vast majority is performed by right femoral vein access, but sometimes uh, also by left femoral access in order uh, to provide coaxiality of uh, the device uh, during implantation. The device success high with 96%. Uh, 
percent and again the overall device time uh, rather short of 70 minutes you see that these patients are rapidly discharged uh, within uh, three days and the vast majority of these highly morbid patients are discharged uh, home which is important uh, to keep in mind now here you see the outcome in this larger population out to 30 days uh, cardiovascular mortality is low 2.4 percent in this overall uh, population you see the uh, freedom of uh, major adverse uh, events amounts to 81.5 percent which is also a rather uh, favorable figure now what sticks out is the incidence of a severe bleeding which in this series is 18 percent but if you look uh, it is uh, re not related to the exercise or vascular complications but rather other uh, bleeding uh, locations if we look then at the outcome as it relates to the echocardiographic follow-up, you see here paired outcomes at discharge and here in 43 paired outcomes at six months. And what again is remarkable is that in over 90% of patients you have no or only mild tricuspid regurgitation. Here you see uh, the uh, Kaplan-Meier event curves on the left side as it relates to survival, which actually over six months is uh, good with 96%. Uh, also, uh, the freedom from heart failure hospitalization is very good in this comorbid uh, population of 94%. Uh, and perhaps from the patient perspective, the most important as it relates to the symptomatic and functional outcome, we see again in 90% of patients only uh, no or minimal heart failure symptoms, a large increase in six-minute walk tests. We are not talking about a few meters. This is 56 meter in average change, and also a large increase in the Kansas City quality of life measure. Anything above 10 is considered uh, uh, very good, and this is nearly a threefold 30 increase. And to put this a little bit in perspective, I just want to go through the symptomatology of new heart class and put this in perspective with the partner 1B trial, you remember these patients that underwent TAVI and it was compared to medical treatment and you see a very similar symptomatic relief. And another analogy is the uh, COAP trial in patients with mitral regurgitation and again you see a tremendous relief in symptomatic uh, load. If we look at the quality of life, you see a similar treatment effect uh, in this TRISEN study as we are used to from the uh, partner 1B uh, uh, trial with very large treatment effect and, lot, and treatment effect that exceeds that one that was observed in uh, COAPT. And finally, if you look at the six-minute walk test, uh, again, you see this differential of more than 50 meter difference. And I put here, in, in, as in comparison, the data from uh, the COAPT uh, study. So in summary, I think uh, the replacement technology with the Evoke uh, uh, valve is certainly a very promising uh, uh, technology. Um, it is striking to observe that it results in near abolition of uh, tricuspid regurgitation in the vast uh, majority of uh, patients. I hope you were able to appreciate the large symptomatic difference uh, as it relates to New York class, the Kansas City quality of life measure and six minute walk test. And I think one thing that is very uh, uh, important we are looking forward is uh, the evaluation in a randomized uh, clinical trial against uh, conservative uh, therapy. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you very much, Stefan. I would propose that we, we move on and ask you then to come back uh, on, on stage uh, to be part of the discussion as well. So we have heard also that uh, the 80-year-old patient of your could be a candidate for annuloplasty as well. So uh, I would invite Volker Rudolf to go um, to, to the, on, on stage. Uh, Volker, you do both um, replacement in study and uh, re uh, repair with annuloplasty device at your center. Um, so we have seen with Stefan that you can uh, abolish um, tricuspid regurgitation with replacement in all patients. Why is anoplasty still essential in your eyes for the treatment of uh, tricuspid regurgitation patients? Well, thank you very much, first of all, um, for having me here. And uh, 
for this not so easy question. Um, but um, let me start with the pathophysiology of, of TR and, this, and, and look at this very nice 3D data from Italy where we see for um, acquired forms of TR um, that we have, of course, differences related to um, tenting, uh, depending on um, whether there is increased afterload, like in pulmonary hypertension or left heart disease. Um, and uh, we have no such tethering in atrial fibrillation, but what you can see that in either form of acquired uh, TR, um, annular dilatation plays a major role. So, we, and, um, so by doing annuloplasty, first of all, what you do is you address the main problem, uh, potentially, of tricuspid regurgitation, which cannot be such a wrong thing. And then one um, further aspect, I think, is um, if we talk about lifetime, lifetime management of patients, is um, that with this therapy, you, you really do not affect the valve so much, and you, you have no barrier to, to future treatments. And, and also, it's a very standardized procedure. We have CD, T, CT planning, and, and this is something I think we learned from Tavi, that you really benefit um, um, from, from such an approach. What are, what are um, Volker, in your opinion, the differentiator of, of the cardioband system for the treatment of TR patient and maybe also some of the anatomic uh, selection criteria? Yes. So, I mean, if we, if we look at selection, um, I, I really want to draw your attention to this um, paper that actually uh, Fabienne uh, led uh, from the PCR focus group, uh, where you see um, the, the proposed classification of tricuspid regurgitation. And if, if we look at these etiologies, then certainly um, cardioband um, is, um, it should be used predominantly in patients with atrial tri um, tricuspid regurgitation, such as in a case um, which uh, Jörg has um, just shown. And, um, this algorithm is also uh, from, from the paper I just mentioned, and um, here we can find annuloplasty, of course, among um, uh, secondary TR etiologies, and uh, there are more or less two scenarios where we can use it. So one scenario is um, the patients we all want to have, it's like not a too large gap central channel um, location and only mild um, tethering. And um, of course you could argue, you can just do edge to edge here, but um, I mean, I would say any loplessy um, on the one hand gives you in such patients a very predictable result. Um, you can be very confident that, that you go out with a good result. And, um, yeah, and the other thing is, of course, I mean, as we move into earlier cases, annuloplasty might play a larger role uh, there as it does um, at the moment. And um, uh, this I termed for the remainder of my talk, standalone annuloplasty. But then we have, of, of course, these cases, which I think we cannot properly address at the moment. And um, we wrote here that in, you know, very advanced disease, large gaps, replacement is an option, but we know that um, um, many patients um, uh, get turned down because annulia are just too large. And here, um, I think we can extend the spectrum of patients we treat with annuloplasty. Also, we have to be fair. Um, we have to tell the patient that probably you don't get a, a perfect result at the beginning, but then you have these future options open. And um, these are two cases of standalone annuloplasty, um, atrial um, um, TR. Um, really predominant annular dilatation, and um, you, you, you can really be sure you get uh, a very good result in, in these patients if you look properly um, at the leaflets. Uh, this here is a different situation, of course. Um, Coaptation gap of 15 millimeters, and I would say um, if the annulus is too large for, for replacement, then there's, there are no good options that we have at the moment. And this is what we um, discussed with the patient and said, okay, hey, we do um, a cardio band, but the result will pro probably not be optimal. And um, this is the, let me go back, this is the result at discharge. So you can see that the coaptation gap got smaller, but there's still severe TR. So we told the patient, okay, you probably might have to come back for edge to edge repair. And um, so she came back, 82 year old lady, one month later, and she said, I'm actually doing 
quite well and we looked at the echo and uh, there was a further reduction of TR and so we just watched and wait and after one year um, TR was almost eliminated and um, I mean this is also an answer to the question with regard to RV function if you look on the left side at the right ventricle you would say this is not a very good RV function on the right side we see a normal right ventricle so this is um, something um, that is really amazing to us. So more in general with regard to patient screening, this is what we want, atrial TR. Um, this is of course more complicated um, if you have uh, so severe tethering. Um, but you have also to look for restricted septal leaflets which occur quite often and these uh, are patients who are better suited for um, edge to edge repair. Leaflets uh, or leads um, are usually not a problem just as for any other uh, therapy unless you have proper impingement of the leaflet um, and I, I already mentioned we need CT planning and what we look uh, for in CT planning is the annular size of course you want to cover the whole distance from the anteroceptal commissure um, to the distal uh, coronary sinus and you want to make sure you have enough tissue for the anchors um, just as shown here in the in the left image um, if um, the annulus is too large and you can't reach uh, the distal coronary sinus, we know that um, efficiency goes down. And um, of course, if, uh, as an ex example shown here, there's not enough tissue between um, the, um, the um, hinge point and uh, the RCA, then you, you will get uh, run into problems if this occurs at uh, too many um, sites where you want to anchor. So I think you have some data to share with us that has been presented this morning. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I, I think this, this was presented this morning. I just want to highlight a, a few facts that I think are really interesting. So uh, one thing is um, the complication rate. If you look at, I mean, particular mortality, there was a lot of discussion about RCA interference with this procedure. But if you look at 30-day mortality, it's, it's zero. So it, it cannot be that bad. And this is our experience as well. If you look at, um, uh, at the um, one-year survival of these patients, you see it's, it's very similar to what we see um, for the other therapies and certainly better compared to the natural cause um, of this um, disease. Um, and um, again, we see that we get with this uh, therapy sustained reduction of, um, of TR after one year. So 73% of these patients are at, um, are in uh, TR1 or 2. And um, we also get um, a really dramatic improvement of uh, New York Heart Association functional class with 92% um, being um, in class 1 or 2 um, after one year. And, um, and you have your own experience as well you want to share with us. That's yeah, right. so this is the data from, from our center. Um, we have now, I think, 68 cases. Um, and this is data from 63 cases. And um, we, we see that um, we treat patients who have really severe TR, so massive and, and, and torrential in 72% of cases. And we can reduce this at, at discharge to 71% um, uh, uh, maximal uh, moderate um, tricuspid regurgitation and um, for some of these patients we also have functional tests which we, which we did here and um, as you can see we, we, we get an increase in, in six minute walking distance which is really substantial and also and this is really um, a very um, valid parameter the submaximal exercise duration so patients have to do the test twice so you, you first test for maximal um, uh, exercise capacity and then you, you, you see how long they can stay on submaximal exercise. And this is, gives you a measure of how well they will do um, during their daily routine. And, and here we see a significant improvement with a very low number of patients as well. As well. So, um, I mean, really to summarize, um, I think you saw the data which show it's a safe procedure. It's a, it's a procedure that um, can, can help us to um, extend or expand the spectrum of patients we can treat. I think we should, we should not think that um, one therapy will fit for every patient in TR. Um, and it's great to have um, more than just one option. And I think um, annuloplasty will play um, a role there, particularly at the moment if we have extensive um, annular dilatation. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much. I think we have uh, we have time for a discussion. Uh, Stefan, would you uh, come come and join us? <laughs> Uh, so uh, th there is one question uh, coming from the audience about the, the timing, the timing of intervention, because we uh, slightly uh, approached that issue about when is it the right time to, uh, to propose to offer the patient a treatment, whether it be a, a, a replacement or a cardioban. Uh, do you uh, believe, let's, let me start with you, uh, Stefan, that for replacement, there are certain patients that are not good candidates, it's too late in their, uh, the, the story of their disease to, uh, to expect a good outcome. Or do you believe that we could treat any type of tricuspid regurgitation at any stage for any patient? Yeah, I, I think that's a very important uh, uh, question. And I think, unfortunately, at this point in time, we probably see patients at a very advanced stage of uh, the disease because the awareness uh, is not there to send patients for uh, e e evaluation of an intervention at an earlier stage. I think this is an evolving field, a little bit in analogy to what it may have been in, in with Tavit uh, 10 years ago. Uh, having said this, um, I think uh, patients that have a life expectancy that is less than one year, patients that have comorbid conditions uh, that are more important than the tricuspid regurgitation, uh, patients that have another effect that it comes in, they certainly should not be evaluated for the therapy. But otherwise, I think there is no reason uh, to withhold uh, the uh, therapy at this uh, point in time. I think the field will be very quickly informed uh, by uh, evidence from randomized clinical trials, and I would believe that if we see a survival benefit that is analogous to what we have seen in TAVI versus medical treatment, then the question, it will be much easier to convince everybody that you should uh, move actively forward. As it relates to the pre replacement, I think we still need um, lots of evidence, uh, I think, in two directions. Uh, one is uh, what is the optimal antithrombotic regimen and, and how long. And uh, then the second one, we certainly also need to understand, uh, just as with uh, other valve uh, types, uh, the uh, durability. But the same applies uh, also to the repair techniques. So let me bounce a bit uh, on the issue of the, uh, the appropriate anti-thrombotic tr treatment, and then I will hand over to you for your question. There is one co question coming from uh, one of our friends in the, uh, within the audience about the, the treatment regimen, the antithrombotic uh, treatment for uh, patients after EVOC. Yes, so I think uh, uh, the patients need to be anticoagulated, and uh, I think at this point in time we don't have any evidence to suggest uh, that you should use uh, either vitamin K antagonists or non-vitamin K or anticoagulants. However, I think uh, if you look a little bit at the data that are available in the TAVI field, you look at the Atlantis trial or you look at envisaged TAVI, where actually the VKA uh, uh, were rather favorable in those that had an ind indication for oil anticoagulation, I clearly think uh, that an, an VKA is probably at this point in time what I would uh, do. I think though there is a lot of potential for the future, and uh, we have now the advent of factor 11 inhibitors, and I think the, the limitation we have in these elderly patients with bleeding complications, I really look forward to, uh, to evaluate that at some point in the future. Okay, please. It's just, uh, I'd like a, um, I'm sorry, <clears throat> I'd like just a quick comment on this. I'm, I'm particularly fond of the idea of uh, repair of, of valve repair, generically speaking. And uh, we now have very interesting solutions to offer to our patients. And, um, and I've also been looking at the uh, workflow you were showing before, saying that certain patients will be candidates for TER uh, or for annulopathy. And then we have those patients which have a group of characteristics which make, makes them unfavorable for these sort of therapies. And usually those patients are actually in a, a more advanced stage of disease. And we're usually educated to the fact that the, uh, the right ventricle handles very badly a huge uh, change in, in pressure balances. So I would like to hear your comment on, for these patients, which usually have large volume of overload, that have high uh, pulmonary pressures, if we reduce suddenly the, uh, the amount of regurgitation to none or trace, 
how how do you how do you feel that most patients uh, will handle this, and how can we improve patient selection for those? And just a quick second comment on that uh, bleeding results you've showed for Evoke. So you've, you showed something like 17%, if I recall, and they're not much related to the procedure itself, so how do you explain this? Thank you. Okay, so first question about the, uh, the fact to, uh, to go from uh, torrential to zero regurgitation in very uh, frail patients with a uh, end stage disease, extremely uh, depressed right ventricular function. Maybe, Philippe, would you, try, would you want to, to address that? Maybe we start with clinical um, reality. We don't see right heart failure in repair. So then that's full stop. Um, in replacement, it will be certainly m more interesting and, and more likely that it could happen. Um, we see sometimes that the RV function drops but recovers, as also shown here in that case. So there's certainly a potential for remodeling. And then your comment about RV pressure and RV dilatation, I do agree when you have a very dilated RV and you add some degree of pressure that they, these patients might be at higher risk. But when you have an RV operating already at a pressure of 60 or 70 millimeters of mercury, why should it be a tremendous problem if you add another three or four or five millimeters of mercury? So I would be more worried maybe in those very dilated RVs operating on a low pressure because they cannot generate any pressure anymore than those who operate on a high pressure. And just to uh, quickly uh, uh, comment on this point, I've been treated patients so, uh, with the Evoke system. It's really impressive the way they behave. You, re you uh, let them go with zero regurgitation and there, uh, there is almost no hemodynamic compromise. So we have something that is really, really impressive. A very short answer about the bleeding. What was the reason, the reason for bleeding? Yeah, I just want to comment on the right ventricle very, also. Very shortly. Um, yes, I, I think you should not forget the septum. The very RV briefly. is part of it, uh, but uh, a large part of the contractility also comes from the septum. So bleeding is related to the anticoagulation that patients have. Uh, and and um, I have experience in, in clinical practice that these patients suddenly come up with spontaneous bleeding. The most frequent is uh, gastrointestinal bleeding. The second one is uh, traumatic uh, injuries. Uh, but having said this, all these patients, 90% of them have atrial fibrillation and they have a formal indication for oral anticoagulation. And I think one thing we need to be uh, um, careful about is uh, to find the right therapeutic target in terms of INR, if you are on a VKA, in the right dose, if you use NOAC, they are all elderly, have renal dysfunction, so you need to go with a low dose, and to avoid combination uh, with an antiplatelet therapy. And again, I'm coming back to my hope uh, that maybe Factor 11 will contribute maybe. to a better profile. So I guess you have one question for our Volker, and then yes, we need Volker, to just one on. quick question. Uh, the surgeon are doing annuloplasty and uh, edge to edge uh, treatment. Um, so we have this uh, opportunity as well. Uh, doing CardioVend and Pascal. Is that something you are doing? Is that uh, in which situation uh, that could be a good option? Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, I mean, this is one of the strengths that you, you can offer these options to the patients. But I must say, among the almost 70 patients that we treated, we did it in two, two cases because we, we didn't have the feeling that we would have to do it in the other cases. So it's, but it's, it's good to have it. So it's rather rare, but it yes. exists. Okay. Keep your burning question. We will answer it after, okay? I promise you. Don't forget it and write it down. <laughs> so, because otherwise we will miss the, the result of, uh, the nice result, I think, of, of Jörg. So Jörg, may I ask you to show us what you did in that patient? But maybe while Jörg is, uh, is preparing, maybe you can raise your hand. Okay, who, who would do uh, edge to edge in that patient Jörg presented, 88 year old? Edge to edge for this uh, patient here? Okay, very few. Replacement? Nobody. Nobody. Cardio so everybody band. do cardio band. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Medical, Medical treatment? Medical. Oh, that's something. Yeah, it's yeah. quite provocative. <laughs> Wrong <see> session. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was expecting you said that's what we did. Yeah. <laughs> You'll comment afterwards. Would be interesting. We need a lot of time to, for discussion. You know? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, we're jumping into the procedure. Um, I'm going to start the video. It's being separated in three parts um, so that we have some time uh, for discussion in between. And when I'm starting this, you will hear my colleague Michael Nebauer explaining the anatomy in more detail. 
comprehensive view is the most informative, in my opinion, on the Black House Kibar. And as you can see here, we have um, a quite standard um, architecture of the valve. Here is the ventricular septum, up here is the aortic valve. This is the anterior leaflet. Here is a large area with papillary muscle and cords. And then there is another posterior leaflet that we call P1, another posterior leaflet which we would call P2. So it's basically a four leaflet valve and a septal leaflet on this side. I show you the papillary muscle structure here. You can see that this is quite broad. Um, it stretches over one and a half centimeters. So that is quite frequent that we have broad papillary muscle areas um, where grasping is usually um, difficult or we try at least to avoid grasping in this area. This is the regurgitation area. You can see that it, is, it extends from the anteroceptor uh, part to the um, central part. This is the P1, the first posterior leaflet. And this is the area that allows the regurgitation. Now, this is an informative view of the sweep over the tricuspid valve from aortic side, which is here, to the posterior side. This is the papillary muscle. This is the calculation of the PISA, uh, which in this case, the patient is well prepared for this procedure. We get an error of 0.2 and a regurgitation volume of 37 milliliters 3D that gives the impression we had from the transcastic group. Here is the aortic valve. We always turn the aortic valve to about five o'clock. This is the septal leaflet, the anterior leaflet. This is the posterior leaflet, the P1 segment, and this is the second segment of the posterior leaflet. So this is the architecture we have. This is the regurgitation we can appreciate in 3D. Now, um, to further improve our ability to grasp the leaflets, we want to do the entire procedure in a reverse Trendelenburg situation. For that, I will now tilt our table in a second, uh, around 10 degrees, as you can see right now. Uh, this will reduce the preload to the right ventricle. and. Uh, will reduce in a shrinkage of the tricuspid annulus, and the leaflets um, will get closer together. Although the gap was already small, we still do this in every procedure to facilitate the grasping. And um, Michael can show you right now, um, perhaps already the impact. It takes about um, a couple of minutes, of course, until we see the full impact. But perhaps you can already appreciate um, in the um, transgressive view, as you can see in echo right now, um, that the gap has been uh, somewhat reduced. We're going to do a measurement perhaps there also. Now the gap which um, is, is reduced to something even below two millimeters at this in this area and when we compare this to the to the uh, <coughs> situation before we did this table tilting, you see that the, this gap has been reduced from three to, let's say, just below two millimeters. Every millimeter in, in gap reduction facilitates our procedure. Maybe we could finish What do you want, do you want to, us to discuss? If you want to discuss, we can discuss it right now, but we can also continue as you want. Yeah, I think we need to continue because we are okay. a bit late. No, for, for an edge-to-edge -edge repair, uh, we're doing, of course, in the preparation, we're doing a trans thoracic and a TE imaging, but, but you don't need to do any um, um, CT study. Oh. On the right side, we performed uh, the, the venous puncture and the insertion of the Pascal uh, tricuspid valve repair system. You see the guide sheet, the steerable catheter, and the um, Pascal implantation catheter. When we're looking at the uh, fluoroscopy, um, and we have introduced the guide into the 
with a tip into the Sophia Vena Cable, which gives us now the possibility that we're going to expose the implant by just pulling back the uh, guiding catheter. We can close the system, as you can appreciate also on the fluoroscopy. We need to further pull back the guide until the marker. And now we are already in the position that we can start tilting the, the system to the tricuspid valve. Now we are already somewhat close to the tricuspid valve. And now we can reopen the system and do our adjustment so that we are perpendicular to the tricuspid plane at the side where we want to treat this tricuspid regurgitation. We are planning um, a two-device two um, procedure, probably with one device going, the first one going into the antroceptal line of coaptation, and the second one probably between the P1 segment, which you have seen before, and the septal leaflet. We're checking the, the the clasps, so this posterior slider is working as you see, the septal leaflet, so that we know if we're gonna need some adjustments in the, uh, in the uh, leaflet grasping, then we can do this adjustment very easily. Now in 3D, you can appreciate already our location the antroceptor line of coaptation runs into the five o'clock position, um, close to the aorta. We are in the central position of the um, antroceptor line of coaptation, so that we have a maximum effect on the um, um, reporting of the tricuspid analysts. This is a, a very rough estimation of our position. We will now change from this 3D view into the transgastric view um, to do our fine adjustment. You see the white big uh, round structure, which is the anterior papillary muscle, and we want to just be um, below this anterior papillary muscle, as you see in this um, with the with the um, in the left image, where the device is still on the, in the right atrium but we are very much, uh, cl very close to the position of the anterior papillary muscle in the central part of the um, antroceptal line of coordination. We are well orientated, and I can now move into the ventricle in this position, which I can also appreciate in the right image. And now what we're gonna do is that we're gonna grasp first the anterior leaflet, and you will hopefully see this in a second, that this is getting immobilized. Right now you see that the anterior leaflet is immobilized. And we can just put down the slider right now so that we have um, grasped the anterior leaflet in this position. Now what I will propose is that we're gonna switch back into the deep esophageal view. This is the view where we then will um, grasp the septal leaflet. We swing very much over as much as we can to the septum so that we have a long segment of the septal leaflet in the device. Now I will reinsert our device into the right ventricle and we're gonna grasp the septal leaflet I swing over as much as I can in this position. The septal leaflet is nicely on, on the Pascal system. And now we're gonna close also the septal slider. And now we're gonna reassess our leaflet insertion so that we're really sure that we have grasped the leaflets ideally. What you're going to see is that we're going to sweep in and out of the device. You see how deep the septal leaflet is running into the apex of the Pascal system. 
and also the anterior leaflet is growing very deeply, so I'm going to now close the, the device fully in the next phase. Okay, Let's, you see that we have a nice tensioning of the leaflets and that the um, Pascal system stayed very close to the septal, um, septal hinge point. So I think this already looks pretty good. We can perhaps just add the color um, Doppler here so that we can appreciate perhaps already some reduction of the TR and that there is no TR left between the device to the aortic valve. This looks pretty good. Perhaps we're going to reassess this also in the transgastric situation. Now we see in this transgastric view very nicely that we are just a little bit above the upper muscle. You can see how the anterior leaf runs into the device and the septal leaf that we are very perpendicular to the line of coaptation. And perhaps if you're going to add some color Doppler flow, we can also see that there is already a significant reduction of the TR. There is still some um, TR left between the P1 segment and the septum. And this is probably something we need to address with the second device. So I think from our positioning and also from the TR reduction, as well as from the leaflet insertion, um, this first grasp appeared to be very successful. And we still have enough room, which is also a major consideration, to place the second device um, just, just then below the first one, which would be in this transgastic view, just opposite um, above the Pascal as you see right now. And now I will unscrew the device from the implant catheter. Now it has been released. And now we're looking by fluoroscopy. We have a very stable positioned Pascal device in the anterior and septal line of quotation. And by echocardiography, you see that our position and the TR reduction has not changed from what we have seen before the release. We will now prepare the second device and then we're going to treat the residual TR in the postroceptal segment. We measured also the, the inflow gradient, which you see by echocardiography. The maximum gradient is two millimeters of mercury and the mean gradient is even zero millimeters of mercury. So we do not have any significant obstruction of the uh, blood inflow into the right ventricle. On the right. Shall we continue? Second this, device. Uh, this would be the yeah the last segment. Yeah. Okay. Here you see that we have prepared now the second device, which is already inserted and in front um, of the tricuspid valve. In the 3D, you can appreciate that, that the Pascal is in its um, 180 degrees open um, grasping position. Um, right in this, in, this, in this spot where the residual TR um, is uh, originating from. So we're just below um, the, the first device, as you can also see by fluoroscopy. Um, we are trying to orientate our device so that we're more or less parallel to the first device as much as we can, so that we're avoiding um, that we're going to uh, pull open any um, of the commissures. Now to go into the right ventricle, um, we like to do this in the elongated version. So what we're going to do now is first we go into the uh, into the cross plane um, image in the deep esophageal view, and then you will see that I'm going to elongate the device so that we can move very slowly into the, into the right ventricle. So the position looks to be very good here. And now what we're going to 
go back into the transgastic view, you will see that we're in this position. We're going to start closing the device to the 180 degrees grasping situation while we're still controlling that our orientation is perpendicular to the line of coaptation. Now I'm going to start to close the device. And we're going to adjust our orientation a little bit. You see in the left transgastic view, the, the device. And I'm trying to maintain the planned orientation. Now the device is already in the 180 degrees grasping position. Now we need to orientate the device so that we can optimally uh, grasp the leaflets in this position. So as you can see in the uh, left transgressive view, we have positioned now the device so that we are perpendicular to the line of cooptation between the P1 segment and the septal leaflet. We're still in the deep in the right ventricle, and now I will pull back the device so that we will grasp the septal leaflet and the posterior leaflet first, which we have obtained right now. You can still, again, appreciate how deep the posterior leaflet is inserted. We're going to close the glass in this position here again. And now what we're going to do is that we're going to try to move over to the septal, septal leaflet. And again, I think we're going to switch now to the um, deep esophageal view so that we have a better view on, on the long septal leaflet. And you, now you can appreciate in the right image that the posterior P1 segment is very nicely um, introduced into the Pascal system. And now we have a very long septal leaflet there. We're going to try to get this as much as we can into the Pascal device. It's a little bit rolling there, so we have to be careful that we're not having a device, a septal leaflet, which is fully rolled in. And now it's very long, and we try to close now the septal, septal pascal in this position. And I'm closing the device. You see how much tensioning we're getting in this position. And now we will reevaluate our leaflet insertion and the TR by, by echo. The leaflets appear to be very well in. We can perhaps add the color flow first in this view and then we want to move in the transgastic view where we can also appreciate nice <laughs> the color flow so there is currently no TR no residual TR left I didn't we believe it swap into the transgastic view which will allow us to check our device position and also get an understanding of the, of the residual TR in this view. So device position, I think, looks good. You see the anterior papillary muscle on the left side, the first device which, which is just below, and the second device which is orientated down a little bit in the V shape and there's almost no TR left um, between the two devices. A very tiny chat there, but compared to what we have observed before, I think it's a very good TR reduction. We're gonna check the gradient, of course, uh, before we're gonna release this second device. Usually the tricuspid valve is 
is so large that even two or three devices, it's very hard to obtain a significant bicuspid valve gradient. We are trying to avoid a, a mean valvular gradient above three millimeters of mercury. You see that uh, this patient is in anesthesia, she is very bradycardic. So we're going to truncate our assessment probably here. As I have obtained only a mean valvular gradient of one millimeter mercury, which is very, very acceptable. Before we go to release, we can also check by, by fluoroscopy. You see this little bit of V-shaped orientation of the two devices, and now I will continue with the release of the second device. And now by fluoroscopy, you see that the device has been released. We are in a very stable situation of the two devices. And now we can also appreciate our 3D echocardiography. This is the 3D color flow. You see in blue the inflow into the right ventricle, but no residual TR um, in this patient. We can confirm this also in our uh, 2D view with a cross plane, which is a little bit more sensitive to the, uh, to the color flow. Also here there is almost no TR left. And now we're going to undo our reverse trend Dalenburg into a normal situation where the patient is flat, the table is flat, and then we can confirm that even in this position where we're now having a backflow of the, of the venous blood into the uh, right heart, that even then our tricuspid rotation maintains what is still very good to our reduction. We can okay. summarize that I think we can stop here. Yes, uh, it, that was a superb demonstration of the, uh, the outcome that you can achieve with the, this device. Uh, there is a question uh, coming from uh, one of our friends about the gradient. How do you integrate the gradient? What is the threshold that you keep in mind when it comes to the selection of uh, a second device or not? Well, as, as I said before in, in the video, we are trying to avoid gradients higher than three millimeters of mercury. There is no known gradient which is really associated with worse outcome. We had this uh, manuscript published where we looked also at grades of four or five millimeter of mercury. The one year mortality was the same as the ones who had the lower gradient. But I think we are in a low flow um, region, so gradients higher than three should usually be avoided. So there was one question. Do you want to propose your question, please? This is, the, is it coming? Yeah. yeah. So this is the question to the panel here as to what is the algorithm now for those patients who have pacemaker-related severe tricuspid regurgitation, number one. And number two, what is you think is the status of the trick valve now? What are the clear indications for that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the second question, I think we're not going to answer <laughs> because we don't know and I think it's not really... Um, we, know, uh, we should focus on what is available here. And um, for the first part of your question, maybe uh, Edith, would you like to, uh, to answer that? In terms of algorithm? In terms of the, the leads. Um, yeah. So normally, actually, um, at the beginning, we were like very concerned about the leads. So we were really cautious, and we were anxious, and whatsoever, maybe. But now, I think, you know, if the leads are flexible, moving. You can really push it in a commercial, you know, somehow between a septal and posterior commercial, more or less, except if it's impinged. So um, you always get in trouble also um, with the cardio band specifically can, can cause pr problems um, with the edge to edge. You're not getting really a great result because the reason is like uh, your lead. So. What we do is actually to take the lead out, look at the tricuspid, treat the tricuspid, and then, you know, add another lead. 
or yeah. uh, Mikra or, or whatsoever, okay. you know. So just, you know, this would be the way. Yeah, I think we can follow up with another question uh, from somebody online asking about uh, the, the possibility to implant a pacemaker after your successful procedure. So maybe, Philip, you want to say, what would you prefer? What is the technique? Would you try a Mikra or rather a lead pacemaker? I, I don't think you have necessarily, you don't necessarily have to go for a Mikra, but can, can just implant a normal lead depending on the experience of the one who does it, maybe um, use some 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 um, imaging to, to to guide the implantation, but it shouldn't be a problem. Or you're going to place a coronary sinus lead, alternatively. Yep. Could be an option. So one final question for you, uh, Jorg. Uh, what about the uh, utility of ice? Well, that's a very good question. Um, we looked a little bit into that. The regular 2D ice is probably um, not very helpful. Um, there are new ice probes out there with 4D ice. Um, they, they appear to be a little bit better, but still the best image quality we're still getting from, from the TE, and if we can use this, then we're pretty happy. But for patients where we have limited resolution, it might be helpful. Jeff uh, Thank you. Uh, you really did get beautiful images, so congratulations. Uh, Two questions. The first, do you always do your your first grasp in the in that short axis deep gastric view? Or do you, you find that move helpful or do you sometimes do both in the mid-esophageal? And the second, I feel a bit of a contrarian to argue with a perfect result. But the to my eye, initially most of the coaptation gap seemed to be between that very large P1 scallop and the septal leaflet. Did you consider just trying a one clip strategy? And would anyone else on the panel maybe consider that just between P1 and the septum in this case? One, one P10. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, the first question was about image quality and no, the. Uh, just do you, do you, for you know, you're for, for, for grasping, you grasp the anterior leaflet yeah. and then the posterior leaflet and the short yeah, yeah, axis. Yeah, so, sorry, yeah. Um, it depends really on the image quality. If we have such a beautiful image quality as we do it here, um, then I think it's very helpful because you already know how much you're in the center with your device. We would like to be very close to the anterior papillary muscle so that we have a, a central effect when we're pulling on the leaflets. Um, but yes, sometimes we are also grasping the leaflets in a deep esophageal view. Um, using one or two devices, this is a, also a very good, important question. Um, I, we, I think that um, in such an anatomy, when you're having a pulling force on the anterior as well as this large P1, um, segment, then you will get a better remodeling of the tricuspid annulus, which in the long term might result in a better outcome. Um, in terms of TR reduction, it can also be that just one device is good enough. I fully agree. But then going in with a second one into the antoceptal line of coaptation is doable, but then you get much more shadowing. It makes the procedure a lot more complicated. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. We need to conclude. Thank you to everybody for attending the session, to the panelists. Um, the last word are yours, Didier Turu. Summarize. Yeah, so uh, I think it's very simple to summarize because uh, we did um, learn a lot about uh, the patient selection. The fact that we now for tricuspid regurgitation, we have a quite large portfolio of available or soon uh, available uh, devices. Uh, so it's all about understanding the, uh, the mechanism, the anatomy of the patient, uh, avoiding these futile patients, and then uh, tailoring uh, the therapy to, uh, to, the, the, to the anatomy that we have. And uh, for the time being, edge to edge repair can achieve excellent outcomes. We've seen that with the, uh, the recorded case. But we have uh, also the cardio band uh, to, uh, to be considered uh, maybe when there is no, uh, when the annular di uh, dilatation without a big deferring is uh, the main me underlying mechanism. And then in the future, we will see what, we, what is going to be the, the place of the uh, uh, replacement therapy. So having said that, I would like to, uh, to thank you, thank uh, all the, uh, the speakers, the panelists, for the quality of the information that you have provided uh, to us 
uh, today. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing that session you, in Lydia. such a beautiful way, and thank you for Edwards uh, for hosting such a, a nice session. Uh, if you want to uh, learn a bit more about uh, now a different topic, bike speed out of valves, uh, stay tuned. You can stay within that room. This is going to be the next session. Thank you. Thank you.